All right, so this talk uh, reports the collaboration between me, uh, my postdoc Yao, uh, Chua San Yao, and James Brennan. Um, and good, okay. So I'll give you a brief, a little outline here of what I'm going to discuss today. Um, talk uh, a little bit just to introduce surface tension and, and uh, how it works to form these interesting phenomena that we call compound drops. Uh, review some of the constraints on the density and the stability of compound drops, what might make them fall apart, what allows them to stay together and, and do whatever they might choose to do. Uh, talk about phase saturation briefly because it has uh, some bearing on, on the, the importance of compound drops and, and the way that they behave. Uh, the reactions between the sulfide and the vapor phase as these compound drops pass through magmatic systems. Uh, and then we'll talk for a little bit of how these things can migrate through magmas that are not completely liquid. Obviously, in a liquid state, they can rise or fall according to their own buoyancy, but when there are solids around, things get more complicated. I'll do a very brief recap of some of the applications people have proposed, including some of our own. Uh, uh, and then there's a little bit at the end, we talk about some other kinds of compound drops. Focus here today is on sulfide silicate vapor systems, uh, but I'll show you a little bit of things that people have suggested, other three liquid or three fluid phase systems that may be important in magmas, and then wrap up. Oh, the pictures in the middle here are pictures from a paper by uh, Jim Taguri and his, I think, postdoc, Ip, back in 1992. And this is just to point out that uh, the people in the pyrometallurgical world have been thinking about this already for 30 years, so we're a bit late to the party here in igneous petrology. These guys pointed out that, uh, that these compound drops can form in slag mat systems and can actually have very deleterious effects on separation of the dense mat face from the slag if the mat floats up into the slag. Uh, the interest in the geological literature was promoted by a paper that we published about five years ago now, a picture is shown here on the right, where we have gas phase, emissible sulfide, and basaltic liquid. So a bit about surface tension. It's something that uh, geologists often don't think about very much. Any surface between two phases uh, is, you can think of it almost as like a two-dimensional phase, and it has a, an energy required to form it. Uh, the more surface you make, the more energy you need to put into the system. So fluid, fluid interfaces tend to approximate spherical forms to try to minimize the size of those surfaces. Uh, and the units, the, the dimensions of the energy per unit area to form surfaces are actually identical to force per unit distance. Newton meters per meter squared, same as newtons per meter. So you can also think of surface energy as a surface tension, which is actually a force pulling uh, along lines on surfaces, which is why, again, they tend to contract into spherical forms because they pull things together. Uh, and where you have multiple phases coexisting, like here, where there's a sulfide drop, vapor phase, and silicate melt, where those three surfaces meet, there's a line, and that's called a contact line. Uh, and if the system is going to be at rest, those tensions pulling perpendicular to that contact line have to be, uh, they have to cancel each other out, otherwise that contact line will move. So I won't go into the details, but because of that fact, you can actually predict the forms that compound drops will, will take uh, in a static situation. This force balance always has to be, uh, has to be met. So if you know the surface tensions, you can easily predict the shapes of compound drops. And so these angular relations at contact lines between here's vapor, here's sulfide melt uh, in a basaltic liquid, uh, the, these contact lines have fixed shapes or fixed uh, orientations. Uh, and so the form of the overall compound drop is, is controlled by these uh, geometric relations here and by the relative sizes of the vapor phase and the sulfide phase. So these three examples 
all have the same surface tensions, uh, but the shapes of these interfaces are, are very different because in this case, for instance, you've got an inf infinite interface between vapor and liquid and the sulfide drop is just poised on the surface. Whereas in this case, you have a little vapor bubble on a big sulfide drop, or here you have a big vapor bubble on a small sulfide drop. Um, so the angular relations are fixed by the surface tensions. The sh overall shapes are fixed by the phase volumes and the surface tensions. Uh, and the differences in surface tensions drive changes in the shapes. And if you plot uh, the ratios of the surface tensions of the phases involved on two axes here, you can map out the shapes of the compound drops that would form. And if you're within this black box, they're stable. If you're outside this black box, the surface tensions are such that the system actually has lower surface energy for, in this example, having the sulfide vapor and vapor phases being completely detached from each other. Or here, the sulfide would be completely encapsulated by vapor. Or here, the sulfide would completely coat the vapor phase. There are lots of examples of these things uh, in the experimental literature, and I've also got a picture here uh, that I got from Steve Barnes. I don't remember where this came from, but it's a comedite with uh, compound drops, uh, vesicles associated with sulfide globules. This is from experiments that we published in 2015. This is Olivier Nadeau. Uh, these two here are from Olivier, and these are both melt inclusions in arc magmas where there's a clear association between a vapor bubble and a sulfide globule. Um, this is a recent work by Iacono Marziano, uh, showing, again, association of sulfide globules with vapor. And, and really, you see these everywhere that sulfide and vapor coexist. You can measure the surface tensions. Uh, most commonly, that's done using a sessile drop experiment, where you put a blob of sulfide, or you put a blob of, of a liquid phase uh, uh, surrounded by another phase. In this case, this is sulfide liquid and, and silicate melt. And in this case, we measured the surface tension by arranging for this blob to be big enough that it would be deformed by body forces so that it's no longer spherical and shining uh, X-ray through the experimental apparatus to produce this uh, cross-sectional view. And then you can do some mathematical trickery and come up with an estimate of the surface tension on this interface. Uh, and people have measured surface tensions for sulfide vapor systems, like here on the right. Um, one thing I should point out here is that there's a paper that's been fairly well cited by me and uh, Zhang Guo Su back in 2005, where we published a whole lot of surface tensions. Uh, and when we wrote the 2015 paper, I went back and recalculated some of those surface tensions. And clearly, there was something wrong with the way we did it back in 2005. So the numbers to use are the ones in the supplementary data of the 2015 paper, and we'll be uh, publishing more updates on that soon, I hope. Um, the melt vapor surface tensions are, uh, are summarized on this figure, which is sort of a, re a reiteration of the figure I showed you a little while ago, but now we've got a fixed value for the sulfide silicate melt surface tension based on those experiments on the previous slide. And so now we can just plot the actual values of the other surface tensions. Again, you get this box where compound drops are possible. And there's a range of measured uh, melt vapor surface tensions from the literature, experimental measurements from quite high values in, uh, in basaltic systems to much lower values in uh, vapor-saturated uh, rhyolitic systems. Uh, and I just want to point out that the, the shape of the compound drop that you expect to see changes as the melt-vapor surface tension diminishes from this kind of shape, which is what we've always shown in our papers and people like to put in their, in their cartoons, to something that looks more like this, where the vapor almost completely surrounds the sulfide globule. And if you look over here on the left, these are uh, apparently frozen compound drops from Norilsk, uh, which we published in 2017. Uh, and you can see that same kind of form where the vapor kind of surrounds the sulfide. 
uh, and in our opinion, this is probably a result of the changing parameters in the system, that these things probably looked like this when they were floating around in the magma, and then as the system cooled and the interstitial melt became more felsic, uh, the, the form of, of the droplets would have changed to look more like this. Obviously, the bulk density of a compound drop, it's always going to be less than the density of the sulfide itself, which is why these things are interesting. Uh, they have the potential to actually cause dense sulfide liquid to float in magmatic systems. Uh, even if it doesn't float, its bulk density is going to be diminished if there's a vapor bubble attached to it. In the example that Yao was, has, uh, has put together here, the neutral buoyancy of compound drop versus enclosing silicate mill is achieved when the vapor constitutes about two thirds of the total volume of the sulfide drop. So this graph here shows the relative proportion of vapor to sulfide, the volumetric proportion as this black line with the scale down here, and the bulk density of the compound drop is this green line uh, with the scale here. Uh, against this geometric factor, which we don't need to explain here really. This is what the, the compound drops look like for each of these values of this geometric factor. So sulfide dominated, dense, these things will sink. Vapor dominated, very buoyant, the, the uh, bulk density is quite low and these things will float. And the sink float transition is somewhere around here where the vapor is about two thirds of the whole thing. <laughs> Yeah, I've done a lot of modeling using COMSOL, uh, multi-physics, to try and figure out what, uh, uh, to determine the, the conditions under which these compound drops are stable, when they will float, when they will sink, and when they will fall apart, and how they fall apart. So if you model a zero gravity system with a fairly small compound drop, here's a one millimeter scale bar, uh, you can get a nice stable configuration, which is similar to the little uh, cartoons that I showed in the previous slides, which were all calculated to, to uh, obey the contact relations around these contact lines. Uh, but if you add gravity to the system, then everything starts to deform. So for the one millimeter drop, you can see a slight departure from sphericity for this vapor bubble because it's being pulled on by the sulfide globule below. If you then allow this thing to, to float in a silicate melt matrix, then it'll start to, in this case, sink a little bit. So now you have melt flowing around the outside, which will further distort its shape. And then down here, he's taken exactly the same system, but he's doubled the size of everything. So now we have a, a flow, sorry, this thing is rising actually, yeah. So you have a counter flow along the edge as this thing is rising. Uh, and you have this rather larger uh, body force at work because now this thing is, is a lot bigger. So the body force is proportionately larger compared to the capillary forces. This body force is scaled with volume, where, which is a cube of the radius, whereas the surface force is scaled with area, which is the square of the radius. So there we are. In this case, in the larger case, the, the compound drop falls apart. So this guy here isn't stable. This is stable forever. It'll just sit together. If you double its size, it'll actually fall apart. And much to my surprise when he did this, he found that the, the way that they fall apart is by a very clean separation. And of course, once I stopped to think about it, it made sense. If you pull on this thing, uh, the contact angles here can't change. They're constrained by, by the surface tensions. So what happens is that this contact line, which is a circle, it shrinks. And the more you pull on it, the more it shrinks until it shrinks to a point. And then the dense face just drips off cleanly. So you get an absolute separation if these things are too large. Uh, and he's done each of these little dots here is one of these ComSol models, each of which is quite a thing to, to run. So this represents a lot of time modeling on our, our fast workstation. Uh, and he worked out some fairly basic relationships between the conditions where the compound drops will fall apart and separate and where they will remain coupled. 
uh, and it depends on the radius of uh, a characteristic radius of uh, a phase in the compound drop. In this case, he's using the radius of the of the uh, vapor bubble, and this geometric factor, which again is just you can see graphically what it represents. So vapor dominated or sulfide dominated. Uh, so what you find is that the, the sulfide dominated things tend to fall apart more easily than the vapor dominated ones. Uh, and the larger the radius, the more easily they will separate. And the lower the melt vapor surface tension, the more easily they will separate. So there's a wide range of conditions where compound drops, vapor sulfide, uh, will remain coupled and will be able to move around uh, as single units in magmatic systems, but there are also situations where they won't. So if you're going to appeal to these things, uh, it's worth taking some time to think about what those conditions are. And, and we worked out a, a fairly general relationship, uh, which you can look at in detail later, but it depends on the bond number, which is a measure of the, uh, the, the ratio between the body force due to gravity and the uh, surface tension. Vapor saturation uh, occurs in magmas as the pressure drops, as everyone's well aware. And to form a new nucleus of a vapor bubble, the melt has to become supersaturated. And if you're familiar with this Gibbs theory of, of uh, uh, nucleation, then, then you'll understand this. I don't have a lot of time to discuss it, but basically there's a, there's a, if this is the free energy of a newly forming vapor bubble, uh, there's a, a free energy barrier to the formation of new nuclei, which is represented by this uh, term here, the, the nucleus, the critical energy for the nucleus. Uh, the larger the surface tension, the larger this, this barrier is. And actually to form bubbles by homogeneous nucleation in magmas, you need about a kilobar uh, of the, the supersaturation required is, is, an L, is roughly equal to the amount of supersaturation you get by under pressurizing something by about a kilobar. So there's a big hindrance to uh, vapor saturation in magmas unless there are other phases present. So heterogeneous nucleation comes to play uh, by lowering the surface energy uh, of, the, of the vapor bubble and thereby through this geometric term, lowering that, uh, uh, the, the, the barrier to nucleation. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in this figure, which I guess I don't really have to have time to explain, but if you've got another phase present, the bubble will stick to it and uh, the more it sticks to it, basically, the lower the hindrance to nucleation. And an interesting little aside here, if that surface isn't flat, but it has reentrance, then uh, you can actually form concave bubbles, which are actually stable in vapor undersaturated magmas. And this plays a big role, probably, in the, the formation of vapor bubbles in magmas. If you have swallowtail shaped crystals uh, in a magma, you can actually have uh, little nuclei of vapor bubbles present even before the magma reaches vapor saturation. Different phases have uh, different geometric factors and therefore have uh, different uh, effects on this heterogeneous nucleation process. Minerals like magnetite and chromite really favor the nucleation of vapor bubbles. And a lot has been said about this recently. Vapor bubbles tend to nucleate on oxide crystals and if they do say so, they might do so, they might cause them to float. Uh, I could go on about this for a while, but that's not the topic for today. But the point here is that vapor and sulfide also show this very strong tendency for heterogeneous nucleation. And that's why when you do experiments, you always find them together. Uh, they stick to each other like glue. Uh, and there's a good uh, thermodynamic reason why they would do that. Now here Yao has calculated uh, as an example, this is the paper that came out earlier this year in, in JPAT. Um, the sulfur and water content in the magma here in parts per million versus the amount that it crystallizes. And this example is a, is a Norilsk dichrite, uh, about 
uh, three quarters of a kilobar. Uh, and so the SCSS, the solubility of sulfur is this purple curve and starting with this amount of sulfur, as it fractionates, eventually you reach sulfide saturation after around 20% crystallization. And he's got a whole family of curves here for the point at which the magma would become vapor saturated and it depends on the CO2 content and the water content. And the point that I want to make here really is that for a wide range of plausible vapor contents, you would expect magmas to reach saturation with sulfide and with vapor at about the same time. And as I just showed, when that happens, those two phases are really likely to stick together. Uh, and so the takeaway point here is that compound drops probably form very commonly in the lower crust. Anywhere that sulfide liquid is present, if there's a vapor phase present, those two will stick together. And so we really need to think about how uh, sulfide liquid is going to tend to be buoyant in the shallow crust, or at least be less dense effectively because of this pairing with vapor, less dense than we would expect uh, based on what we've always thought in the past about its high density on its own. Uh, again, lots to look at in these diagrams. I don't want to spend too much time on them, but, but Yao has, has modeled the physical behavior of compound drops. In this case, he used an Etna basalt because it's thermodynamics, and vapor saturation, and so on are all very well understood. So it was a great subject for him to work on. Key points to make here, here's density of the compound drop, which is fairly high at a pressure of 200 MPa, and it falls as, as, the, as the compound drop rises with the magma. And the reason that it's falling is because the pressure is decreasing, and so the vapor bubble is growing. And you can see here, Schematically, he's shown how the vapor bubble gets larger and larger as the system depressurizes and volatiles go into the vapor bubble. And um, the, uh, the volume of vapor over the volume of sulfide is increasing along this curve here. So it's kind of a runaway process. And so as a result of that changing geometry, the relative velocity of the compound drop against the surrounding magma is also increasing. So at the bottom of the system, it's actually denser than the host magma. So it has a negative relative velocity, but as long as the magma is rising, it can still carry these slightly dense compound drops with them. Uh, at some point, the density crosses over and from that point onwards, these uh, compound drops are actually less dense than the surrounding magma and they rise. And this is for a variety of, of water contents to get this family of different curves all for the same CO2 content. And so in general, you can see that, that uh, ascending magmas in the shallow crust are going to tend to see sort of a runaway process of compound drop flotation. Uh, and they can float so fast that uh, they actually might fall apart due to capillary forces, or rather due to the, the uh, shear stress as they rise through the magma, the, the, uh, the shear along the margins of the compound drop can pull it apart. So he's shown here the capillary number, which is a measure of the balance between viscous forces and uh, surface tension. Some of these compound drops might actually fall apart in the most water-rich systems and drop the sulfide somewhere along its ascent path. Although in a lot of other cases, they can rise together very near the surface. <laughs> Five minutes, Jim, if that's all right. Okay. Um, this is something we modeled in our, in our uh, Nature Geoscience paper some time ago. Uh, again, the, the volume of sulfide over volume of vapor is decreasing as, as the drop rises. But the, the other thing to point out here is that the, and, and the density is, is decreasing, but we've also got a reaction between the sulfide melt and the vapor. As the vapor bubble's growing, uh, sulfur dissolves in the growing vapor bubble and its composition changes. Uh, so metal will also be transferred from the sulfide to the vapor and, and this sulfide droplet uh, can actually disappear completely. It can be completely absorbed into the vapor bubble and as it does so you would expect its composition to become strongly fractionated. Uh, the gas sulfide reaction is very fast but diffusive re-equilibration with the surrounding magma is rather slow so the entire sulfide globule can be absorbed by the vapor bubble and then blown off in a process that fails to re-equilibrate with the surrounding melt. 
So this is potentially a very powerful uh, mechanism for moving metals up through magmas and then venting them into the atmosphere. We modeled this, uh, Norilsk uh, calculated uh, the concentration of nickel that you'd expect to see in the vapor phase in the degassing uh, compound drop. And of course, depending on the amount of chloride available to the system, uh, you can have very high nickel contents over 100 ppm in the vapor or somewhat lower if there's less chlorine available uh, as a ligand in the vapor. Of course, that vapor, as soon as it's exhausted into the air, all those metals will condense as aerosols and they might blow around the world and, and have environmental consequences. Uh, compound drops uh, may migrate through crystal mushes, but of course that is going to be impeded by capillary forces. There's a lot has been said about this. It's kind of a contentious issue. Uh, Parmigiani et al. have shown that, that uh, under some circumstances, vapor bubbles can move through mushes, and in other situations they can't. Uh, Alan Boudreau has done analog experiments showing that if you compress the system and squeeze out interstitial melt, that melt can carry bubbles with it. Um, and I've done work that shows that during second boiling in a crystal rich system, that's probably not going to happen. So there's more work to be done, I think. Uh, you can sum it up by saying that if you force vapor in the bottom of a mush, or if you rapidly compact out the melt, then the bubbles can rise. But during second boiling in a static system where the only source of vapor is the interstitial melt, that's probably not going to happen. And yeah, it's modeled this and shown that basically if you've got flow from below, which is helping to push the vapor bubble through a constriction right here, and the vapor bubble isn't too big, uh, then the compound drop can stick together and move up through the system. Whereas if the constriction is smaller relative to the size of the vapor bubble, then you will force the sulfide drop, basically skim it off, and the vapor can continue, but the sulfide remains trapped. So summing this up, there's a quite a wide range of possibilities for the migration of compound drops in crystal-rich systems. And, uh, they may or may not be able to rise. I'm close to the end here. Um, a number of applications to real systems have been proposed. You can look at all these papers uh, if you want to see. There's, there's lots of creative thinking recently about how this might affect magmatic systems and the transfer of metals in the crust. The last little aside here, it's been pointed out that uh, there are other kinds of liquids that can coexist with sulfide. For instance, this bismuth liquid here was trapped by Annenberg and Mavrogenis, a paper they just published earlier this year. They've got a sulfide liquid globule stuck to a bismuth liquid globule, and it clearly has this form of a compound drop. It, re it crystallized during the quench uh, to look like this, and other sulfide minerals, nickel bismuth mineral here, and the bismuth metal. James Brennan and I were interested in this. We're somewhat reticent about how many, how many situations this might actually apply to. And he's done some experiments. These are some uh, preliminary results. And here he's taken sulfide melt, equilibrated it with bismuth melt, these bright dots, and silicate melt, and measured the, the deportment of bismuth in the system. And he finds about 50 ppm bismuth in the silicate melt at equilibrium with bismuth melt and sulfide melt. So that's 50 ppm bismuth in a bismuth melt saturated system. And this is the bismuth concentration in a whole bunch of different kinds of basaltic magmas, morbs, OIBs, and Bacharach basin basalts. And, and the takeaway point here is that it's not likely in most melt dominated systems that you would reach saturation with bismuth melt and sulfide melt at the same time. The bismuth is going to dissolve in the sulfide melt uh, and not be present as a discrete phase unless you fractionate this system to the point where there's hardly any sulfide melt present. And you've got a very, very, very high air factor and then you may be able to have both of these phases present at the same time. So Probably these separate tabs liquids do form as immiscible phases in magmas, but they probably don't do that unless there's a solid framework, solid of, uh, like in melting the mantle, for instance. 
Uh, there's obviously much more work to do on this. And uh, Iacono Marziano pointed out last week that this might happen when uh, sulfide droplets are consumed by reaction with vapor in compound drop systems. So interesting to speculate about what is going to come out of more experiments and, and more modeling of all this. In conclusion, compound drops are probably ubiquitous in magnetic systems in the, in the upper crust where vapors and sulfide coexist. We've seen them in comadiates and picrites, and we've seen them in melt inclusions in arc magmas. They're probably important vectors for the migration of dense sulfide liquids in the crust, and they may contribute to extreme fractionation of metals in degassing systems. The, the ultra mafia are embracing this idea pretty widely, but people in the porphyry community aren't, aren't so excited about it. Uh, but I'm beginning to see a few citations maybe in the plumbing system, if not in the actual ore forming process in porphyries. And lastly, there are lots of other possible three phase fluid uh, melt systems to consider. So thanks for your attention today and I'm done. <laughs>